Uh, next, I think our final, uh, excuse me, uh, we have uh, Jocelyn Foy, board president and executive director of the Woman Project. Uh, do we have her on? Yes, you do. Jocelyn Foy, welcome to House Rules. Uh, okay. uh, thank you for joining us today. Please proceed. What I would like to talk about is you testified recently before the House Rules Committee. Right. right. And what I wanted to talk about was like the process of that, because obviously we're not going in person to the state house anymore. Right. And we have to call in. We have to make arrangements ahead of time by 11 a.m. in the morning. So can right. you like run me through how that worked for you? Because I noticed they had a picture of you that they used. I did. And all this other stuff. Um, I noticed the Senate, which had testimony last night, did not run pictures. They just had uh, phone testimony. And they didn't even say the name of the person. So I, was, I just wanted to talk about what this process is like and how it changed, because I know you've testified a lot. And sure, thanks for asking. I mean, yeah. one, I'd say, I think that they're testing things out. They're trying to get a, they're trying to figure out how to do this. So I was testifying in the House um, Rules Committee yep. and the Woman Project uh, had put together a sign-on letter, which 41 organizations had, 40 organizations had signed on with us about us looking at models that were happening in states around us that were building basically an infrastructure that continued to include the activists and the general community that was interested in following what was happening still mm -hmm. at their state houses, but because of COVID restrictions, wanting to make sure that we were all safe. So your organization was one to sign on. Thank you, your C3, we appreciate that. That's huge. Um, but I mean, you know, what I'd say is, is that, um, I got, yeah, so that letter was great. We were thrilled that that happened and that so many people saw it. We saw it as to be a, a really excellent intersectional touch across the state of mostly smaller not-for-profits and grassroots organizations, but um, a few bigger ones, which was awesome. A lot of uh, church organizations also recognizing the importance from Muslim um, to Christian to Catholic and such. So, and so um, we have to, so the processes in the past, is we've either on the day been able to go to the state house and sign in and say that we were interested in testifying, um, or we had to call in the day before, found that the uh, rules committee was accepting written testimony at a certain time and that they were accepting oral testimony at a certain time. And so I got in on time. So, so but really what happened was, is we then wrote our piece. We submitted it. It's what I read. So I just read the document in front of me, which is common. I'm not always comfortable just going off because I Neither can say all sorts of things. <laughs> so it's good to keep me on path. Um, but the part that was fascinating was, is that, um, and I'd say this, this made me happy was that here I am someone at work. I'm a working mom and I can't get up there. I live 40 minutes every day, drive away from the state house so I was able to call in and they had a picture of me on this projector. Okay, so for people to understand at home on my screen, I saw a picture of me and I could also watch the recording that was being that was coming through from their feed. Yep. So I could see what my vis the visual was in that particular case. Um, I lucked out, they picked a picture of me. So they had a list of people who wanted to give oral testimony. It was myself, it was John Marion from Common Cause, and it was Steve Brown from ACLU. Those two gentlemen are constantly giving testimony testimony in these areas, right. of, this is their areas of expertise. So there were pictures of them up with their names and their titles. And I was like, oh, this should be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to me, who's a grassroots organizer, but uh, they pulled a picture of me off Google okay. with my name, wrong logo for our organization because it's slightly modified in title, and um, but they had something up there. So I took a, a couple things away from that. I made me it made me concerned because whoever I'm guessing it was the clerk, whoever the person was that had to do that had to do that work, if they had had any relationship to me whatsoever or they were against the causes that I am testifying about, they could have picked all sorts of awful photographs. It just so happened that one of the first ones that came up was one that 
because my area, my day job, I'm do a lot of SEO work and I know about how to do coding for code, like back end code stuff. Right. That picture had been well SEO'd of me and had been up for a long time. And my sister is a professional photographer and had taken the picture. And so it was something I was using a lot for other things. So, I mean, there was a couple of lucky, lucky things there, i.e. the family connection, but more luck was is that that person was willing to put a good picture of me up. Yeah, I thought that's what occurred to me too after I found out that you didn't choose the picture. Had you right. had you called in and said, oh, can you send us a picture and a logo right. that and helpful, right? No. But if you don't get to choose the picture, I mean, I know there's a lot of bad pictures of me on the web. Oh, and, gosh, yeah. You know I, mean, I mean, we all have them. Right, because right. we're out Most there. people, yeah, right. right. So, um, so, I mean, some takeaways that I thought were excellent for us in general yeah. in the grand scheme of, scheme of things is, we, here we were speaking to testimony about access and I was literally having access. I mean, right. I was having access in the form of I can make the call from my office at 5 PM where I'm sitting and doing work. They called me by the way. So I had to give them my name, my email, phone number. They called me and said, okay, are you ready to go? You're going to be on in 30 seconds. <laughs> like, okay. okay. <laughs> so access was great. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say, this was so new to them. Right that they didn't really know how to present this. And for anything, like things in the past that I've testified for, there are lists that are something like 70 some odd witnesses. Right. And so there would have been no way for doing that. And being a graphic designer, I understand it takes time to put these sort of things together. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I hope that it's something that they do, not necessarily the picture part, right. but I think that what we were writing that letter about directly was happening in this moment, right? I also I also thought it was a positive thing. I thought that yeah. was like, I th you know, it opens up the possibility of more people being able to testify, yeah. which may be tougher because now we could have long nights of testimony on certain bills. But right. on the other hand, I thought, you know, the access of like not having to drive two hours and hang out for hours while they discuss other bills. They call you when they're ready. You right. You could be doing anything else. You could be cooking. You could be at home. You could be doing anything in the world. You could be right. out at a restaurant and say, let's right. get outside, do someplace quiet. I'll just do it from the. I thought, no, I, I think, I, I yeah. think that it's doing what we're asking for, which is during this time of hyper danger for our health, they need to take certain restrictions for themselves that I didn't see were present. And, and that's something that the resolutions were touching on. So right. the behavior for the actual general assembly members themselves, but some were from right. home and they were giving testimony as well. So the people on the committee had to be there. Um, cool. And the main resolution presenter was there. Would you like so, this continued yeah. afterwards? Like Say that like again? The, would you like to see telephone testimony like this continue? Oh, absolutely. Even after that, COVID? Absolutely. We would have so many more people able to testify. And of all sorts of walks of life where, as you know, but maybe folks don't, we only meet on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, session-wise. Right. We're only meeting from 3.30 to 5.30, or the there's like a chunk of time there where most of us who have day jobs, it's absolutely impossible for us to get there. Anyone who has kids who can't take care of themselves can't be there. We don't have a health care plan in place or child care plan, excuse me. I mean, some states do it on the weekends or some have in-house daycares. I mean, these are things that we've looked at and we go, how, how do we forge that path for asking for those sort of access touch points? But let's start with COVID. I mean, yeah. the restrictions are dangerous and, and, and irresponsible of our state. And so, we're going to start there. <laughs> okay. okay, well, thank you for helping with all of the technical wherewithal. Uh, good evening, Chairman Carvacci and members of the House Rules Committee. It's nice to see you on my computer, but speak to you through my phone. So we sort of see you. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Foy. My preferred pronouns are she, her. I live in Wakefield, Rhode Island, and I am the executive director, as you said before, of the uh, Woman Project. I am speaking in support of House Resolutions 5006, 5007, 5008, 5009, 5010, and 5011. So the Women's Project, if anyone doesn't know, um, is a grassroots organization founded in 2017 by a group of Rhode Island organiza uh, organizers and local artists who wanted to take a fresh approach to sexual and reproductive rights advocacy that harness the power of art, activism, and advocacy. Um, from 2017 to 2019, the Woman Project fo focused on the passage of the Reproductive Privacy Act, as you might know. Um, our approach has been incorporating grassroots mobilization, artistic activism, 
and educational campaigns. Rhode Islanders have engaged with us greatly because it acts boldly and centers the needs of those often overlooked by racist and sexist institutions. On November 17, 2020, the Women Project, along with 41 diverse organizations, sent a letter to every member and member-elect of the Rhode Island General Assembly calling for change, demanding an open, accessible, and engaging process for the 2021 legislative session. I hope that you see that, but I also submitted that again um, as a piece of this process. Um, we cannot dismantle systemic and institutional racism if we exclude people from the legislative process. Uh, current legislative processes do just that at times. We must use this extraordinary moment in our history to rethink how our institutions function and make them better to meet the needs we have now to improve the participation engagement in the future. So Representative Kids Life Resolutions address some of these issues raised in our letter and other issues which also improve the democratic process. For Resolution 5006, um, I, cannot res I cannot emphasize how important this ruling change is for Rhode Islanders from our standpoint, as well as the 41 other organizations. Uh, a well-functioning democracy requires the active participation of the people. The Women Project has substantial experience mobilizing Rhode Islanders to engage in this process at the State House. We've observed firsthand the barriers to access many Rhode Islanders face when engaging in the legislative process. In the past, working folks, disabled individuals, and lower income folks have struggled to participate in these hearings. I have coordinated transportation for those who do not or cannot drive to the State House many a time. We have watched other children um, so that someone could testify. The pandemic and public health concerns have only compounded these barriers. Allowing uh, remote voting for House committees is the sensible response to public health concerns. Allowing video testimony for the public will greatly expand access by eliminating the need to get to the State House. It also allows the juggling work and family an earlier method, um, an easier method to participate. I will note that I am calling you from my day job at an office building. <laughs> uh, for House Resolution 5007, requiring the consent of the majority and minority leaders to suspend the rules creates an unnecessary hurdle to change, placing one or two individual lawmakers on a position to foreclose the will of the majority is anti-democratic from our position. So for 5008 through 50, 10 House rules um, each serve to remove procedural barriers that prevent an expedite process for bills to become law. There's no value letting bills languish regarding House Resolution 5008. There's no reason to push the term. Regarding House Resolution 09, 5009, excuse me, uh, too often bills enter limbo after they're passed out of committee. Bills that have been passed at a committee should be placed on the floor calendar for a vote expeditiously. Uh, Rhode Islanders deserve to know, on the record, how the representatives stand on bills that have been passed out of committee. And finally, House Republican uh, Resolution excuse me, 5010 helps to remove the sting of the held for further study bill classification. As we have seen with numerous good bills, once the bill is quote unquote held for further study, it effectively kills the bill by preventing any legislative act action on the bill going forward that session. By allowing the bill's prime sponsor to request reconsideration of the bill by the committee, the bill will get an opportunity to leave committee to receive a floor vote. So finally, House Resolution 5011. The Rhode Island budget is the single most important bill that the General Assembly must contend with each session. The budget bill is usually hundreds of pages in length and contains provisions that affect every Rhode Islander. And yet, the budget is exempt from the requirements that bills must be noticed at least 24 hours before the vote on the bill is held. Legislators, the media, the ordinary Rhode Islander should be allowed time to clarify, um, carefully review each prov uh, provision before the vote is scheduled. The 24-hour waiting period should also apply to the budget from our position. So in conclusion, the House has the opportunity and the obligation to reimagine how participatory democracy works in our state. I sincerely hope that this resolution passes and they remain in place long after the pandemic has ceased, and that's a really important part of our point here as well. Now uh, is the time to remove obstacles, ensure the legislative process is inclusive, inclusive of all voices, and clear procedural barriers from the path the bill, of the bill to a law. Thank you all for hearing me up today. Thank you, Ms. Foy.
Um, does anyone have a question of uh, the, the, the witness? Well, Ms. Foy, thank you for your participation. We have your um, we have your uh, uh, your written testimony also. We'll put that in the Great. record. And uh, we thank so and we thank you for your participation.